priča počinje tako što je Steli kada imao 16 godina kladio se sa svojim vratom da niko ne može da bude uspešan, bogat i srećan ako nije s one strane zakona ili akademijski građani. Mnogo godina kasnije Steli dolazi, živeo je u Nemačkoj, Steli dolazi iz San Franciska. Šta je onda bilo, on će vam sam ispričati. Please welcome Steli Efti. That was an awesome intro. I have no fucking idea what she said about me. <laughs> so, uh, that's interesting. All right. Um, so first of all, uh, raise your hand if you have no fucking idea who I am. You've never heard of me before. Please be proud. There you go. <laughs> this is good for my ego. <laughs> Whew. All right. So, <laughs> there's still a lot more work to be done. So, here's the deal. I'm going to tell you guys 10 stories today. Uh, that happened over the past 10 years of me moving to Silicon Valley from Europe. All right, before, but before we get into that, uh, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page when it comes to the goal of this talk or the next hour or so that we're going to be spending together. Right, this is one of my favorite John F. Kennedy quotes, uh, and it's the standard that I try to set for myself. Again, I'm not trying to be too arrogant, but the whole point is, like, if you look at this room, there's a lot of fucking human beings in this room. I'm going to spend an hour here. You're going to spend three days, four days at the conference. This is a lot of humanity's time invested in one place. And a lot of times people go to conferences to be inspired. They go to conferences because they don't want to go to work or, you know, they want to do something that looks like work but isn't really work. My goal for this talk for the next 45 minutes is not just to tell you some funny stories and entertain you and, uh, and, and make some of those heads that went up and said, I have no idea who you are. At change, but my, my goal in this talk is to at least impact one person here to think that if this idiot can do X, Y, Z, maybe I should do more with my life, right? I'm going to try to be an inspiration for doing more, and for today's conference, I would make that little homework to myself, if I were you, is to make sure and set the goal that by the next three days you've made at least one decision that you've been fucking around for weeks not wanting to make. You've made at least one new connection. You know that thing? You go to a conference to meet new people and you always just look for, who do I know, who do I know? Oh, I know this person. And then you just hang out with the three people you know for three days, avoiding to meet anybody new, right? So, one decision, one new connection, and one action, something that you can do. Call a friend. If, if you have nothing better to do, by the end of the talk, call your mother or your dad and tell them you love them, right? But do something that you wouldn't have done otherwise. Does that make sense? This is yes. This is no. This is I don't care. Just leave me alone, right? But I need clear responses. All right, let's get started. So, a little bit about myself. Uh, somebody made this. I didn't make this myself. But this is pretty much my life motto, right? And if you think about what is the qualification that Sally has to be speaking to us, there is none. I have zero qualifications, right? And, I, and I'm still here. I'll give you a little bit about my background. I'm originally from Greece, but I grew up in Germany, right? The two ends of the European cultural spectrum. And... Ten years ago, I decided to sell everything I had about a one-way ticket to San Francisco. I have not made it through school. I barely made it through kindergarten, so I don't have any degree in anything. I have zero qualifications. Sometimes people ask me, Steli, you've been a lifelong entrepreneur. You've built all these different businesses. What made you choose that path in your life? And I always go, lack of options. Right? Lack of options. I'm completely unemployable. Nobody here would ever give me a job. So I had to create jobs and hire myself for it, right? So my entrepreneurial superpower, if I have one, is that I hustle, you know? What you lack in talent, you have to make up in hustle. And I, I, I do not possess any marketable talent. So what I've always done and the way that I've moved the world forward is by taking massive action and by using communication to move things forward. Does that make sense? Cool. All right. I'm going to be checking in with you guys once in a while, as you've noticed, just seeing who pays attention and who doesn't. All right. So let me start with my first story about my Silicon Valley experience. And I know that, you know, a, a lot of people here might think, you know, uh, you know, if you live in America, if you live in, the, in Silicon Valley, everything is different, everything is bigger. So I want to share a little bit of insights from an insider, but from somebody that can relate to the European experience, right? I come from a very small village in Greece. I grew up in a fairly small town in Germany. I'm as European as, a, as you can be. So 10 years ago, when I decided to sell everything I had, bought a one-way ticket, went to San Francisco, 
I had no real visa. Today that would be hard, but back then I kind of got away with it. I had like a tourist visa or something. I had no hotel, I had no clue. I arrived at San Francisco airport and I asked somebody how to get to Silicon Valley. Now, Silicon Valley is not a city. It's a general area, right? It's like saying, how do I get to the south of Serbia? Like, where, right? It's too broad of an area. But somebody was nice enough to just tell me, but you mean Palo Alto, Stanford University? I was like, Stanford, I've heard of that name, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, take that train and then get out on that stop. I took the train, I took the wrong stop, right? It's at California Avenue, it's one stop after University Avenue, which is the avenue I should have taken. Uh, but California sounded good, so I stepped out, I walked down the street, and there was it, Hotel California. And I was like, that's it, I heard it in a song. This is a sign. <laughs> I'm checking in here. Now, here's what happened next. A lot of people that hear me talk, they think, Stelly is so different from me. Stelly walks into every room, kicks in the door, screams at people. Uh, you know, it's inspiring for him, but this doesn't work for me. I'm not that type of person. I'll share a secret with all of you today. And the secret is that I'm not that type of person either. It's hard to believe, but I've trained myself. I don't like to kick in doors. When I go to, to networking events, I don't like to talk to people either. Like, this is so much effort. <laughs> I'd rather just stay here. You know, it's one of the reasons why I give talks. It's so beautiful. Afterwards, the people that want to talk to me, they all come to me. So I have to do the work of going to the people and figure out who to talk to. So first day, I check into the hotel. It's like 2 p.m. And here's my inner dialogue. My inner dialogue is like, all right, I unpack my bag. This is my laptop. This is the hotel room. It's my first day. I might have jet lag. I don't want to get into you know, any trouble. Maybe today I'm just going to get acquainted with my hotel room. Just, just stay here. Just relax, watch a movie, work a little bit. You know, Just decorate the room, make it feel like home. Maybe just stay here. It's safe here. And really, that's what I really want to do. Just fuck, stay in the hotel room for a day and then tomorrow figure out what to do next. But then I had this inner voice and that inner voice is what I've cultivated over the years. I've trained that inner voice and that inner voice is what drives everything I do. And then inner voice was, fuck you, asshole. Get the fuck out of the hotel room and meet some people. Like you didn't fly 15 hours to San Francisco to stay in the hotel room. Nothing good will happen here. And this is a lesson for all you people. Nothing good will happen in your hotel room or your living room or your office. Nothing fucking good happens there. Everything worthwhile, you need to get out of your comfort zone. Because everything you already own is within your comfort zone. You already accomplished it. The people you know, the things you've done, that has generated the results you had so far in life. If you want more results, you have to get out of your comfort zone. So I told myself to get out of the room. And I looked up online, what are some meetups or events I could go to meet people. I found something, I went there, I sat down, I talked to all the people. And then eventually I talked to this guy that was pretty famous in Silicon Valley. I didn't know that. The guy was like, what's your story? I'm like, well, it's my first day here. I don't know anybody. I took a one-way ticket. I'm just trying to meet people, and I want to build this business that's going to change the world. And he was like, it's your first day here? You just took a one-way ticket? That's amazing. Call me tomorrow. I'm like, all right. I'm looking that guy up, and I'm like, oh, shit, this is one of the biggest bloggers in the U.S. It's like, he has like 10 million readers on his blog. I'm like, holy shit. So anyways, so I'm in my hotel room, I'm getting, you know, I'm calling the guy, I'm like, yeah, hey, how's it going, I met you yesterday, I'm this and this, and he's like, well, where, which hotel are you staying? I'm like, Hotel California, he's like, I'm going to be there in five minutes. I'm like, okay. <laughs> so he picks me up, we drive to a coffee shop, I sit down, and before I can start drinking the coffee, he's like, wait, wait, wait. And he goes back to his car and he brings this massive camera set up, and he sets everything up, and he hits record, and he's like, all right, who are you? And he interviews me for one hour. That interview still exists on the internet. It's not that easy to find, but also not that hard. So if you're really motivated, you can find that video. And that video is the most painful thing for me to watch. It's the most painful thing ever. I, it take, first time I watched it, it took me six hours to watch it. I was doing this, play, oh, pause. You know when you watch a movie and you feel guilty or like you feel, uh, um, you feel like embarrassed for the character? <laughs> That's exactly how I, I was constantly embarrassed. I'm like, I look like a fucking idiot. You should really watch that video if you want to see the delta of my first day and then today, right? 
Um, I look like an idiot. I had no fucking idea. Here I am, I'm being interviewed by this massive guy. The video was seen by hundreds of thousands of people. Awesome. First day. We end the interview and he goes, what's the plan for the rest of your day, Stelly? I'm like, I have no plans for the rest of the fucking year. I don't know. He's like, well, I'm speaking at this event in San Francisco. You want to come with me? I'm like, sure. So he takes me with him. He, we go to this event. He speaks at the event. And at the end of this event, they had this rule, 20-second soapbox. Anybody in the audience could get the microphone and make a little pitch for 10, 15 seconds. Like, we're raising money. We're looking for investors. Come and talk to us. Or I'm trying to hire developers. If you're a developer, come and talk to me. So again, what was my inner voice? I was sitting there. I was like, you have nothing to say. You don't know anybody. Just relax in the seat. The day's been going pretty good so far. Just take your wins and shut the fuck up and don't get greedy. And then there was this other voice that was telling me, shut the fuck up, motherfucker. Grab the mic and say something. <laughs> so, you know, I, I don't want to do these things, right? But I've cultivated the habit of doing them anyways, even when I don't want. So I grab the mic and I go, listen, people. I'm from Greece, I just arrived here, it's my first day, I need friends. And everybody started laughing. Like, if you want a Greek friend, thank you. <laughs> right, if you want a Greek friend, come and talk to me. So there were the three speakers and myself. Each speaker had about 20 people around them, I had like about 70. Like everybody in that, half the room came and gave me their car. At the end, they were like waiting for 10 minutes and like throwing their business card. Just call me, you know, leaving. And for the next two weeks, all I was doing is like <laughs> emailing one person. Hey, you know, remember you gave me your card? I don't know exactly what to do next. Do you want to hang out? And the first two weeks were pretty, a pretty wild ride. So... I need somebody to be shouting the time. I had some agreement with somebody here. To every 10, 50, there you go. Have we been 50 minutes in yet? Yes, you need to help me here. We're never going to get through this presentation. If somebody just, usually, if I had a timer, I could pace myself. But if I don't, I'll speak for hours. Now, you people will never get out of this room. Right? So I'm Greek. <laughs> I'm Greek. All right, so this is story number one. Let's see if we can get through 10. All right, second one. Um, so this is, I, I, I will share a few stories today I've never shared before, right? Uh, and this is because I, I made that bold claim because the conference organizer wanted to know what my talk is going to be about and I always don't want to tell conference organizers because I don't know until the day of the conference. I need to meet some people, I need to go walk in the city and get a sense for who's the audience and what do I think they need and then I try to put something together for them. Uh, so he, here's a story, how I got my visa and I'll make this one short. I, you know, for the past 10 years, I've seen hundreds and hundreds of Europeans specifically come to Silicon Valley that wanted to stay there and build a business, a technology company there. 90% of them, they leave because they think they can't figure out a visa, a work visa. It's pretty hard to, to figure out. And some of them just think it and some of them try and fail and they go back. Lots of people, right? Lots of people. Here's what happened for me. When I moved to the U.S., I, since I don't have a college degree, I cannot get the most popular work visa in the U.S., which is the H-1B. It's not an option for me. Uh, getting married, was I felt a little rushed in the first week, so I was like, maybe that's not an option, right? Um, uh, and then, so I looked around and I researched, and I went to a, a bunch of lawyers, right? I, been, I went to a bunch of lawyers, and the first five lawyers all told me, Ah, uh, no, sorry, there's no visa for you. There's just no way. Maybe you want to go back and study? You know, it would be good for your future anyways. Um, so uh, most lawyers told me that there is no option for me. Now, again, most rational human beings, what do you do? You go to an expert, the expert tells you, this doesn't work, you just take it. Especially if you grew up in Germany. Like, when you grew up in Germany, one thing you learn is to just abide by the gods of authority, right? The, I learned this, I, I realized that about myself living in the U.S. where... Police officers would stop us and my American friends would be like, fuck you, I know my rights, da 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 I was like, holy shit, I would never talk to a police officer this way, right? All kinds of authority, like th there's just no respect for authority in the U.S. and there's a lot of it in Germany. So usually the expert tells you there's no way and you go, oh, no, there's no way, and then you move back, right? But if you want to be an entrepreneur, one of the core things you need to cultivate is when you tell me there's no way, I'm going to look for making a way or finding a way or creating a new path. Like, I'm not just going to accept that, 
right? Because if I accept the rules and the ways that have been passed before me, then there's no real opportunity to be an entrepreneur, right? I can just be an employee, right? I can just do the job. So for me, I went to lawyers until I found a lawyer that told me there is an option, but it's probably not going to work out. I was like, well, tell me more. She's like, well, you know, it's the O-1 visa. It's the visa for exceptional aliens with exceptional uh, abilities. I'm like, all right, tell me more. And she's like, well, you know, it's actually for athletes or if you're a Nobel Prize winner or if you're like some kind of a famous, you know, you know author. But, you know, Steli, exceptional is open for interpretation. They, there's no clear rule on what that means. I'm like, all right, <laughs> tell me more. She said, well, yeah, well, there's five categories that you can be exceptional in. Each category you need to prove it. There's seven ways to prove it. There's reference letters, press, da, 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 all these things that you would have to collect as evidence that you're truly exceptional as an alien and that should give you that visa. And for the next three months, what I did is I worked on the visa for three fucking months. I created, I had over 24 reference letters. I created all kinds of press. I, I made all kinds of magical stuff happen that generated the proof to show that I'm exceptional. Now, my application was like 800 pages or something. And typically, when you apply for that visa, they, the, the average time is about two months, and then they tell you yes or no. If they tell you no, you have to leave the country within 48 hours. But until they process the application, you're allowed to stay the country. So. Two months is the average. The first time I applied, it took them 10 months to respond. I'm just imagining somebody taking that application and then going, no, not today. <laughs> not today. I'm going to do something else today. And for 10 months, every day I would go to my, to my uh, uh, you know, mailbox and look, do I need to leave the country or not? No. All right, let me go and try to hire people, get investors, build my business every fucking day. You know, so... Eventually, I got it, and I think the first time around where I got it, it was really like, you know, a coin toss. It took them forever. It was with a lot of luck. My evidence was really shitty, very shaky, right? It's not that if somebody today showed me that application, I'd be like, I don't know, dude, 10% chance you'll get it. But the second time around, it got easier because the second time around, I, you know, I hustled a little bit more. I got to know more people. I knew that I would need another or one visa application in three years, so I need to generate more evidence during those three years. And then the second time around, I got all these famous people. I got Oprah's producer. I got Ashton Kutcher. Do you know that the actor Ashton is awesome? He wrote me a reference letter. I got all these famous people, all this famous press, and my application got done in eight days. I got approved in eight days, right? But the, the point is that, like, you know, we all want to be humble, we all want to be self-aware and know what we're capable of or, or not, but I think that you, we also need to learn, especially if you want to be an entrepreneur or be entrepreneurial, that if you stick with the you know, rules and boxes of what other people tell you you can or cannot do, you're not going to make it, right? And you need to search until you find solutions that seem impossible or impossible. Probable. All right, uh, the next thing. This is a more of an embarrassing, embarrassing story about myself than anything else. When I arrived, a lot of times people from Europe asked me, Steli, how did Silicon Valley make you think bigger? You know, we Europeans, we always think too small. I find that everywhere I go in Europe, people have this like, complex about their own country. Like, oh, my country sucks, right? Which is one of the things that's great about the U.S. There's a lot of things that suck about the U.S., but Americans don't have that complex. The European, we're too small, we're too this, we're not really that great, right? Um, fuck all that shit. But anyway, so when I arrived in, in, in the U.S., I thought very big. I thought within a year, I was very arrogant. And I was like, within a year, I'm going to change the fucking world, I'm going to be Steve Jobs' best friend, and I'm going to be Time Magazine person of the year. I hate to ruin the suspension, but all this, these things didn't quite work out the way I wanted them to, right? All that didn't work, obviously, but I had this arrogance, I had this idea I thought would change the world, and then when I would meet other entrepreneurs, I would look down at their ideas and be like, that is what you're going to... I met the founders of Dropbox when they just were starting out, and I was like, file sharing? File sharing. That is what you do with your life. File sharing. Really. I'm like, that's not a problem. Like, there's already solutions for that. What the fuck? Same thing with the Airbnb founders. I met them when they were still struggling. They were like, couldn't make the whole thing work. And I was like, guys, this is the stupidest fucking idea I've ever heard. Air mattresses in people's homes, and then those people have to make you breakfast. What the fuck is this? This is never going to work. Obviously, I'm an amazing predictor of great ideas. 
right? If you want to get rich, just invest in everything I think is ridiculously stupid, <laughs> right? But I was very arrogant, and, and you know, the thinking big part, it's, it's great to have an active imagination if they have very, very large goals. That's awesome. That can be inspiring. That can be something that truly moves the world forward. But you want to learn to act in small steps. I've learned that small is beautiful. Small, radical action right now. If you do that every single day, if you take massive amounts of small doses of action over long periods of time, you move the world. You change everything. I was doing something. I was building an education platform, and I'd started a blog around it. I was just giving free lessons online, creating these virtual classrooms, allowing everybody to teach and learn from everybody. And it was going really well. The blog was really growing. Things were going well. And then I went to Silicon Valley. I was like, that's just a blog. I need to build this massive platform. And it needs to do everything and anything. And since I've never built software, I'm the greatest product manager to decide how to do this. And since I have no idea, I'm going to hire this team of other developers that have no clue. And we're going to find these investors that have no idea. And we all collectively together are going to fail. Right? Slowly and painfully. There was somebody else that was competing with me, and what he did was beautiful because it was small. He did the same thing I did. He was just doing these micro steps, but he never ever stopped. He was uploading three, four, five YouTube videos every single day with little lessons. And he did that for two years, and the videos had 30 views, 100, 200. And then over time, they started having a few thousand, and then tens of thousands. And then eventually, Bill Gates mentioned him on a TED stage and boom it explored millions of views he'd been doing the three four lessons every day on youtube forever humbly just creating a little bit of value for a little group of people but doing it every fucking day and then it became this massive platform right and i, I was never able to compete because i wanted to take that massive step in one big take that's something i see again and again with entrepreneurs it's the best recipe to fail you need to know thyself and accept thyself. So, um, as I said, at first I thought I needed to be... So, one of the problems that I see with both founders, but also with humanity in general, is that we don't truly know who we are, or if we do, we don't quite want to accept that. Right? We, don't quite, we, we quite think that's not enough, and it should be something else. Something else is better than what, who we are. So, a lot of founders think they need to be a certain type of founder. So, in Silicon Valley, every founder thinks they need to be a product focused founder, somebody that is either a developer, an engineer, a designer, somebody that can, is very product focused, right? So when I arrived in Silicon Valley, I thought I needed to be a product founder. So I was product manager of my company. I was basically micromanaging all these engineers trying to build a product. And I was like, I was fucking it up because I'm not a product person, right? I like good products. I have some taste, but I'm not a great product manager. I just didn't know that. And I didn't want to accept that about myself because how can I become Steve Jobs' best friend if I'm not like Steve Jobs, right? So you, I had that idiocy and, and complex. And then when that wasn't working out, we did all kinds of things and it just didn't work out. We pivoted and we did something different because Google knocked on our doors. We wanted to be an end consumer platform, something that millions of people would just use. And then Google's director of education got in touch with me and she said, I love what you've built. We want to use it to have all our engineers teach and study from each other and educate themselves. And we want to pay you massive amounts of money. Now, I never wanted to get into the enterprise space, but the opportunity just fell on my lap. And I was like, it's Google, and maybe they'll acquire us. And they give us a lot of money. And then I, may, I concussed some solution in my mind to make that new reality work, which is, again, something I see every day entrepreneurs do. I came up with this plan. Well, maybe we're going to be giving the education for free to the people, and then we're going to have the businesses pay for it. Maybe that's our business model. Who am I to stand in front of you know, the universe and stop what the universe's plan is for my business, right? So although we had no experience in enterprise sales, we had no fucking money to acquire enterprise level customers. And we had, I had one engineer and myself, we had a team of two. That is not the setup to sell to massive organizations. It really isn't. It really is not a smart idea. But I was like, well, if they force me to take all my, you know, my product and give me their money, I'll let them. And what did I do? I was like, well, let me go and see if other people want to pay for this. And I went to a bunch of big companies in, in, the, in the Valley area, and everybody wanted to buy my shit. Intuit wanted to do a pilot. Oracle wanted to do a pilot. And I, for a brief moment, thought I'm the best person. Like, I'm the smartest founder in the universe. Everybody says enterprise sales is so hard. It's not. 
I'm an immigrant. I barely speak English and I can get all these big deals. Like, what's the problem? The, the problem was that none of these pilots worked out, right? Google fucked around for six months. The, she, the, the director of education, which is an awesome person, is a very good friend of mine now, she pushed it off to some manager. That manager pushed it off to some project manager. That product man project manager, she never gave a fuck about the pilot. She didn't care about it. She didn't know why should she care. I never communicated. I had no experience about enterprise sales. I, they said they're going to buy their Google. I'm just going to take the money, give the software, and let them do the pilot, right? That was awesome. Nothing happened during that pilot. So six months in, the director asked what was happening. Well, the pilot didn't work. It was not quite a success. And they were like, all right, thanks, but no thanks. I was like, oh shit. Or it, I'm not going to bore you with all the stories. Oracle, nine months, it would have been the biggest deal of our lives. I was working my ass off, the one engineer, we're like not sleeping, where we need to close this Oracle deal. It's going to be, you know, a, a seven figure deal. This is going to make the company, it's going to finance all the future things we want to do, all that stuff. And then nine months into it, just a few weeks away from signing the contract, all my emails bounce. And I'm like, what's happening? Like all the people I know at Oracle, the emails bounce. And I go to Yahoo News and I read, oh, the senior vice president that I was working with, his director, all the managers, all left Oracle. All of them. He became CEO of some other company. They all left. I didn't know anybody anymore at Oracle. How awesome is that? Just 10 months of work for nothing, right? So. It's that it's finding the balance between being delusional and going, how hard could this be? Let me do it. And realizing what your strengths and weaknesses are. It's that is what the trick is in, in figuring things out. This is a very quick point I'll make. Don't steal Google's bikes. They really don't like it. <laughs> I'll make this story short, but it's again a story I've never shared with anybody. Uh, Google, on Google's campus, there are these funky bikes. They're really shitty, I don't know, $10 bikes. They're uh, painted in all kinds of colors. And they're there for people that want to move around campus. Campus is pretty large, so people can just go on these wobbly bikes and get from point A to point B, right? So um, we had abused these bikes a number of times just for fun, and we were just riding around. And then one night when I got accepted, with, with, this is with a different company, right? The old company has failed. I'm bankrupt. I'm depressed. You know, all, all that good stuff. So, uh, and then the next company that I started, we got into Y Combinator. I don't know if you guys know that. It's a big, important incubator. And they used to give out 25K checks. And then two weeks, a few weeks into the, the program, they said, we have a big announcement. You have to come. It's a big surprise. We went there. And this billionaire Russian uh, investor says, I'm going to give $100,000 to everybody just for fucking, because I want to. And we're all like, whoa, shit, that's amazing. 100K we didn't expect. What shall we do? Let's go out and get drunk, right? So we all go out and get drunk. And then in that drunken state of enthusiasm, we have all this energy, can be channeled. It's Mount View. There's really nothing to do there. We're like, what, get, let's just get on some bikes. Let's just fucking bike. It's us and a few other startups. And we have, like, it's my, my two co-founders, myself, and then our two interns. And we all go on the campus and we're very drunk. I don't remember all the details, but we're wobbling around on these bikes and we do all kinds, we, you know, drive into buildings and all kinds of things. And eventually there's like security showing up and people like, oh shit, they're leaving in all kinds of directions and we're fleeing the scene. Next morning I wake up and in our office there's a bunch of Google bikes. <laughs> They're like, what the fuck? The next few weeks, investors would come into the office. They would all laugh. They're like, what the Google bikes? Well, we got drunk. We had a good story to tell. Everything was cool. They put the Google bikes out in the balcony. One week before the biggest demo day at YC, where you speak in front of the most important investors of Y Combinator to raise the round. One week before that, I walk into that office, which is more of an apartment building, and I see police in front of the, the door. I'm like, oh shit, what's going on here? And they're like, do you live in this apartment? I'm like, no. Well, who is? I'm like, people? Why? <laughs> like, whose are these Google bikes? You stole those Google bikes that were out in the balcony. And I'm like, I don't know whose bikes or what bikes they are. And they're like, oh, they make this whole thing. I think that my co-founder, everybody is outside. They're actually inside not opening the door. It's a big mess. The Mountain View police, these bikes are worth 30 bucks in total, just to give you an idea. An hour into the interrogation, the police officer is like, all right, I need more backup, please. I'm like, backup? But, 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 I'm just one person. Like, where's the, <laughs> I've been talking calmly with you. Why? Don't tell me how to do my job. All right. So there's eight fucking police officers standing around. Eventually, my co-founder is like, these fuckers aren't going away. So he opens the door. He's like, yes, I'm on the lease. Talks to them, blah, blah, blah. 
to make a long story short, they were looking for the third co-founder, is also European, half Swiss, half Polish, that, and they were looking, they were very aggressive, they have nothing better to do Mountain View, there's really no crime there, so they're like, this is it, this is going to be the thing for the year, and uh, they're like, we're going to be coming back every few hours until we find that guy, and they make a huge stick, and they're like, your visa, you might not get the, you might get kicked out of the country, they make a huge deal out of it, so we tried to do all kinds of funky things to get out of the situation, but the, the important part of the story is that we were hiding in a hotel, uh, until demo day because we didn't want to get arrested and not be able to present the demo day. And the funniest thing about that shit is that the night, I, the, the night before demo day, in that shady hotel, cheap hotel room that I was in, I hear a bunch of like steps and then I hear police and I lost my shit. I'm like, are they fucking kidding me? Is police here? And I hear like all this noise and I go slowly to the door and I'm just looking through the thing and I don't see anything. And I hear, police open the door. Da, da. I'm like, they're looking for me? And they have the wrong door? Like, what the fuck is going on here? I freaked out a little bit. And it turned out that just that night, they arrested somebody else in that hotel. <laughs> right? Because I'm so important that I just killed somebody and they would find the hotel room I'm hiding. Right? But anyways, it was still, still a funny thing. And the, the, Paul Graham was one of the biggest, most influential investors in Silicon Valley. He was laughing his ass off as I was telling this minutes before I had to go on stage because he was like, you know what? I hope police comes and arrests you. That would be the funniest story ever. We had nobody ever arrested at a demo day. It would get you so much publicity. All right. I could uh, tell you a bunch more funny stories, but here's what I'd rather do. I'll, I'll tell you the follow-up one. Whoever is like, don't cheat me out of story number six, send me an email, motherfucker, and I'll share it with you. But I'll tell you the story secretly. But... Um, if, if there's one thing that I've always been teaching, and it's the highest piece of value advice I give, is that you need to always follow up. You know, some people might show up, show up at a hotel room, show up at a conference. Most humans don't follow up and follow through, right? That's where, where most deals go to die. That's where you compete with nobody. And I have this story uh, that, that I usually tell. I'll tell the short version of it because I want to tell you a more important one, which is uh, at the time where I got introduced to a billionaire investor, by email, he said, yes, I want to meet with you, Steli. And then I emailed him, hey, can you do Tuesday or Thursday? And I didn't hear back. And I emailed again, and I didn't hear back. And I emailed again, and I didn't hear back. 48 emails later, right? 48 emails later, you know what his reply was? Huh? Let's fucking meet, yeah? His reply was, you know what, so I appreciate the follow-up. Uh, we had a crisis overseas. I just came back. Can you make 1 p.m. work tomorrow at my office? And he invested in our company, right? When people, when people go silent on me, I, my assumption is that people just have problems in their life. There's something else going on. I'm not the center of the universe. When they are quiet, I don't take that as personal rejection, which is what most humans do. I emailed you once, I emailed you twice. Then I think, oh, he thinks I'm ugly. He thinks I'm stupid. He thinks he's something better than me. Chill, motherfucker. He doesn't care about you. He hasn't seen the emails. Nobody gives a shit, right? When we have a good connection, I will never, ever, ever stop following up until I get a response. Yes is good. No is good. I just need a response, a resolution. Did this work or didn't this work? I'm not going to allow anything to stay in the maybe land. Maybe land is where startups go to die. Maybe land is where everything that could be life-changing in your life will go to die, right? Your job is to make sure you push things into a resolution. Yes, no, but not maybe. And this is the only reason why I'm at this conference. So every year it's getting harder and harder for me to say yes to new conferences because I, I'm doing a lot of these. These guys, the web is guys. Vlada, is he in the room? Who are you? If you are in the room, he's outside. All right, he's hiding. All right, so here's a story I have to tell about him. So he, the first time I heard about web is was in 2015 where somebody else that I spoke at, a, at a, uh, Vladimir from, from, one other, from another conference, I spoke there, he introduced me to Vladimir and was like, you should go to WebIS, it's awesome, just please go. And then Vladimir got in touch with me and said, yes, you should absolutely go, it's an, come to us, you really need to come to us, and I couldn't make it. And they sent me another email, and then another email, and then they made this shady thing, they told a bunch of their friends, yes, I know, I'm not stupid, they told a bunch of their friends, go to Twitter and say, oh my God, I heard Stelly maybe comes, that will be the most amazing thing ever. So all these people, hey just because it's fake doesn't mean it's not working right 
So all these people are like, oh my God, this would be my wish. I can't believe it. There's the gentleman that was like, get my money. I hear, hey, he's laughing. Like, oh, so, so they kept bothering me. Like, I think overall, what was it? 11 follow-up emails over two years to get me to a fucking conference, right? And that is... Besides my wish to visit the amazing country of Serbia, I have childhood friends from Serbia and I've never been in this country before. That, that is the reason I'm here. Now, that might be good or bad for you, right? That's a different story. But the point is that these guys, the reason why they make this conference happen five years ago and the reason why it's growing and the reason why they have speakers come is because they don't give up. They follow up and follow through. You know how many uh, conference invitations I get where I reply, mm, can you tell me a little bit more, or I'm not sure if I can make it, and I never hear back from them, ever. The tell me a little bit more is actually a template that I sent to almost everybody because I know 70% of people I'll never hear from again, right? It's as simple as that. These guys just kept at it, you know, on Twitter or LinkedIn, oh, all these, half of Serbia is waiting for you, Stali. <laughs> I was like, all right, well, if I'm so popular, as we've seen at the beginning of this conference, <laughs> everyone's like, who the fuck is this guy? I don't know. All right, so for those of you that are like, oh my God, I can't get enough from Steli, how can I get more? I've written five books. I've uh, uh, written a lot of templates to make life easier for people. If you want all the shit that I've ever written that's valuable in a neat download link, you send me an email that says bundle motherfucker. And you send it to steli at close.io. And then I will ignore you. <laughs> and those that follow up with me will get it. Does that sound like a deal? Yeah. All right. Let's see how many people do it. People are like, bundle mother... No. Fa mother... Fa I need to get this right. Otherwise, I won't get the bundle. Steli at close.io. It's not that difficult. All right. So... I skipped story six. I never had uh, intended to share eight and ten. I thought we'd do a little bit of Q&A and I'll share some more stories with you that way. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? All right, let's wake up, people. Okay, so how do we do this? I know that I'm, I'm five minutes before my time, but I think we'll make it 15. All right, we'll make it Greek 10 minutes together. So how do we do the Q&A thing? Do I throw the... the Who summoned you in a question if you have one? There you go. Boom. All right. So who has a question? Raise your hand. Not everybody at once. There you go. The, thank you, sir. I, I actually will come to you because I don't want to hit this in the face of somebody. So we'll make this a very lame version of it. There you go. All right. Ask your question, sir. You, I think you need to speak into the thing. There's a mic but it doesn't work? All right, just keep asking your questions, just shout it, and they'll fix it later. Why Combinator you applied? Okay. Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a tip here. So thank you for the question. He asked, hey, we applied for Y Combinator, this prestigious incubator. We're going to go anyways, but would you take a look at our application to give us feedback, right? That's the question. Yes. Unfortunately, I've written about how to write the application, how to hack the process. So every six months, I get hundreds of emails of people that are like, can you just look at my application? So if I were you, there's two ways you could do it. So I will always say yes. I always want to help people, right? So my, my natural tendency is to do, of course I'm going to look at it. But the reality is that I have a shit ton of emails that I haven't looked at yet. And the next few days are crazy. I'm traveling all around the world. So if I were you, here's what I would do. I would have my application ready, right, on a laptop, on a tablet, on a phone, and then I would go, you know, motherfucker, I'm not going to even ask you. The, you know, wh when I'm mingling right after this, I might be talking to too many people, maybe not, but I would grab me at the after party somewhere and make me look at it right now, today at some point, give you feedback today. Let's just get it off our to-do list. That was anyway the idea? All right, well then... I'm gonna hide from you and let's see who's more determined. He's like, no chance, motherfucker. This is Serbia. I know this place. <laughs> All right, next question. Okay, I have a question for you, and it's uh, when it's when you moved to USA, yeah. and how long did you need to wait for the first success to come? A real success yeah. in a business. So uh, the first five, years, first five years were a soul-crushing failure and defeat. The first company failed in year one and then four years 
into it, I was pretending it wasn't failing. And at the end, it was like a skeleton. I was like, no, no, it's fine. If we give it some water and some food, it's going to magically turn into this alive thing. It was dead, but I couldn't accept that. So first five years were horrible, and then much harder than I thought. And then uh, after that, I started a company that was a lot more successful at the beginning. Then it had its own difficulties, but through some pivots and points, it turned into what you could consider a success. So let's say seven years, to be, to be fair. So you're seven years. You're living in the USA for seven years right yes. now. And one more question, uh, just as a follow-up. Um, for the, how many times you have failed? One, once With or more? With companies, yeah. general, in my life? Yeah. <laughs> in my life, too many to count. Honestly, like, I, it's not just a cliche. The amount of things I didn't succeed at is a very long list. When it comes to companies specifically, uh, that's a good question. I had two companies in Germany that were su very successful. Then I had one company in Germany that was not a success at all. Then the company in the US that was not a success at all, so that's two. Then I, so three companies that failed. Uh, overall projects, probably five to ten. You know, and then I had two small successes in Germany and now one big success in the US. That's the company close I owe. Yes. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Can you please tell us what is close I.O.? Yes, I paid her to ask this question. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, it's gonna, no more questions, people. This is going to take the rest of the session. So uh, close I.O. is a CRM system for inside sales teams. So to simplify this, if you do sales to other businesses, and if you call businesses to sell them, or if you email businesses to sell them, we have built a software system that allows you to do that better and more and therefore grow revenue uh, with customers all around the world. We have a, 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 we're a very small team in this space. We're just 20, now 25 people. We make many millions in revenue and, uh, and with customers all around the world and a lot in Europe as well. Thank you, my favorite person. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> Next question. The bus is <laughs> oh. There you go. That's sir. All right, let's see, let's see how good you guys can throw in Serbia. Boom, nice work. Oh, I got it. Uh, let's talk about failures. And when I say failures, I mean your failures. Uh, what's your most significant fail? What? I, uh, what? Most, the most significant fail. And when I, say, when I say most significant, I think the game changer fail. The fail that made you <coughs> this, what you are now. The, fa the failure that made me what? That made you what you are now. All of them to a certain degree, but I want to not give you a cop out and give you, I'll give you two examples. The first company that I worked on for five years, it's probably the most significant failure because it, it destroyed a lot of ideas I had about entrepreneurship, about how I needed to be to be successful. And it was the company that I was most attached to. I thought I was born to build that business. I thought that's my, it's going to be my legacy in life. That's the reason why I exist. Hence why I didn't want to kill it when I thought it's not going well. Right? Because I was so attached with it identity-wise. It took a lot out of me to let go. And, and once I let go, funny enough, just a few weeks afterwards, I had this, this newfound clarity. I was like, all this shit is wrong. This is the way you need to do things. This is the way to go. And then when I started the next company, I was like, all right, motherfuckers, we're going to do this. Boom, 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 boom. And we had a lot more success. And I changed my, I thought that entrepreneurship was all about 19 hours in front of my laptop and eating shitty pizza all day and drinking 25 Red Bulls a day and working seven days a week, never taking a break. And I was always telling my team, it's fine for you guys to take a break. But I looked at them, you know, and I infused guilt when they wanted to take a break, <laughs> right? Just like a good old grandmother or, or mother, just guilt. And uh, I made everybody miserable, and I was never really productive. I was like in front of the computer for 18 hours and working 25 minutes productively, and the rest was just fucking around. There's a lot of bad habits I had that I, that, that, you know, I got out of my system through that. Um, there's a talk I gave, and I can send you the video if you're interested, where I had to fire half of my company uh, in one day, and I had to dance uh, to InSync's Bye Bye Bye. Uh, doing that, that was the, the most horrific day uh, as an entrepreneur I've never had, I ever had. In hindsight now, it's one of the greatest stories. It's, I'm so excited and happy that I had that experience. It all turned out well, but it was the day I most hated being an entrepreneur, for sure. All right, next question. So, Stelio, my Greek friend. <laughs> 
can I buy you a coffee right here and right now? Don't ask me, mother. Like, don't ask for permission. Ask for forgiveness. If you want to buy me a coffee, go buy a coffee, cappuccino. No, okay. no cream. No, no sugar. sugar. Take a to-go cup, and then wherever you find me, you hand me that motherfucker, and you start talking to me. Okay, great. All right, that's it. Next question. What's the here, right here? Oh, what's the story number ten? I don't know. I, well, I told the story of like uh, me dancing bye bye bye. That was the story that I wanted to put in there, but I thought I'll never have time. Um, uh, so yeah, that that day sucked a lot. So I had my firstborn child. I had had sleep in three four months. The company was going through this massive transition, and I knew I'd have to fire a lot of people. And I fired people, and this is the suckiest part about being an entrepreneur, but always because performance was not there. I never had to let go of A, a bunch of people one day, and B, people I liked and did really well, just because the business had changed direction, and it didn't make sense to have these people in the business. So that was the day, and I was so, such a wreck emotionally that I hated life the most. I was just dreading that day. And then in the morning as I was driving to work, I remember that one employee that I had hired a year before, she made me promise, dude, if you ever fire me, you need to give me a cake and you need to play Bye 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 from NSYNC. And I was like, no problem. I was like, oh shit, I made this promise. So I turned around, went to Safeway, bought a cake, downloaded Bye 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 from NSYNC just in case you wanted it. And I talked to all these people and, and spent a lot of time telling them the rationale offering them a two-hour meeting next week with me to help them accomplish whatever they wanted. You want a job, I'll spend two hours with you finding you a job. You want to start a business, I'll start it with you next week. Like, I'll give you two hours of time after you've decompressed that you were let go today. And we'll make, I did a lot of things to make it right. And the last conversation I had was with this lady. And at the end, you know, we hug, we cry, and, she, and I'm like, you know, I promised you the instinct thing. I, I'm okay if you don't want it, but if you want it, she's like, oh my God, you bought a cake? I'm like, yeah, it's in the fridge. Awesome. And you're gonna dance to in sync? I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you said play. You didn't say dance. There's no fucking way I'm gonna dance. Five minutes later, the entire room, all the people that were let go and all the people that stayed, munching on the cake, and I'm dancing to in sync. <laughs> and I, for, I was, for, you know, it's, it's forbidden to record a video of this. There's all 12 people that recorded a video of this. <laughs> And uh, there's even a video online about it. And, and the funniest thing is, a friend of mine saw it and he was like, dude, you were always such a great dancer. How, what happened to you? I'm like, motherfucker, I didn't try to dance well. The whole idea was I make an idiot of myself so other people can feel good about themselves. The point was not for me to be a great, to just like make a great dance session. But that was one of the almost horrendous days I ever had. Afterwards, all these people that were let go, all of them are close our customers today. All of them had amazing careers. Uh, uh, by the fact, two weeks ago I was in New York and I spent uh, three days with people that were all in that group. Um, so I'm good friends with these people. They're all customers, paid us a lot of money by now. And, uh, and we've, we've maintained a really strong network and relationship because we treated people really, really right. But it doesn't mean that it felt good. That day before I opened the office door, I'd rather would have like stabbed myself in the heart. Like I so much didn't want to have to go through that day. Yes. I have seen very little of Serbia. I've seen the airport, where, which I've been visiting before. I like it. And then I've been in a car ride here. The car ride was, you know, pleasant. And uh, then I've seen this hotel. This morning I walked around and I checked out the, the city a little bit. I like it. It's surprising. It reminds me a little bit more of like Austria or Germany infrastructure-wise than Greece. I thought it'd be as fucked as Greece infrastructure-wise. <laughs> But it's not, it looks, the streets are much nicer and all that. Um, so I don't know, I, I, I'm looking forward to explore Serbia a little bit more over the next few days, but so far so good. Yes? One simple question, uh, your favorite hustle, big or small, doesn't matter. My favorite hustle or yeah. hustler? Hustler. <laughs> and a hustle. Hustle as in what is your definition? Uh, hustling uh, is the definition, uh, most favorite thing you've done for yourself. Oh, the thing I've h worked really yeah, hard on yeah, hustling yeah, yeah. got. Um, I don't know, dude. That's a good question. I don't know. I cannot tell you anymore. I, I can tell you the biggest difference in my hustle. All right, I'll, I'll share that with you. That was also potentially a story. So for the first 15 years of my career as an entrepreneur, I was very inconsistent. I had brilliant weeks, and then I had shitty weeks, right? I basically, and, and on average, my months always were kind of good. 
So I was like, ah, eh, you know, on average, I'm doing really good. Internally, I was never satisfied with myself because when I looked at the mirror, I knew that I'm not living up to my full potential and that sucks. You can't be happy or at peace with yourself when you know that. But it was like the monthly result was okay. And so what would happen typically is that whenever I, I would wake up and I'm not the great of a morning person, I would wake up in the morning and would feel shitty. And then I'd be like, I have a call at 8 a.m. But I feel shitty, so I really don't want to do the call. <laughs> and then eventually I'd be like, ah, I'm going to reschedule. So I would ping them and go, can we do the, I'm feeling sick, can we reschedule the call? And then I feel, feel even worse, because I just canceled the call, so I would cancel the next call. And then I would cancel the meeting, and then I'd just fucking cancel the day. Right? I'd just feel horrible the entire day. And that's the way I would go to sleep, and then that's the way I would wake up. So I would repeat the first day. So what would happen is, I would have this micro moment in the morning not feeling good and it would turn into a fucking week of me canceling most of the things and not doing anything productively. And that was what fucked me in terms of like, I never accomplished the things I could have accomplished if I didn't have that. Eventually, I got over myself. And I learned this mantra, that's going to be the last thing I'll say, or they, they'll, they'll, you know, the conference organizer is going to get a heart attack or something. Um, so, yeah, we're fashionably late. So, um, the thing, the mantra I've, I've cultivated is, um, do it fucking anyways. You know, I learned that just because I don't feel like doing something, that doesn't mean anything. I always tried to do all these things to not feel bad. I was like, I'm going to, all these psychological things, hypnosis, I studied the human psyche and all these things, and I wanted to be the superhuman that always feels great. That doesn't exist. What I learned to do instead is, when I really don't feel like doing something, I do it anyways. I'm like, but my inner dialogue goes, but you're going to do a really shitty job, Sally, if you do this interview this morning because you really don't feel good. And I go, well, then I'll do a shitty job. Then I'll do a horrible interview, but I'll do it anyways. And then because I do it, although I don't want to, I feel pretty good at the end. And I'm like, what else did I want to do this year? I'm going to do it right now. And these bad moments turn into the greatest days and greatest weeks for me now. So finally, over the last three years or so, I started becoming consistent. Hence why my success today is much greater than it ever was before. All right, that's it from me, people. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Oh, I'm not leaving the stage. <laughs> no. I'm just going to stop talking, but I'm not leaving. Uh, I didn't come here uh, to get you off the stage. Uh, I have a confession to make. Another one? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I didn't felt uh, goosebumps like now. Uh, Maybe only when, my, when, when I met my wife. And this wow. is the second time. So uh, you have one big thank you for making my life miserable <laughs> last two months. So, thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me for the follow-up. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Stelly. Ukoliko do sada niste znali zašto je Steli Eft jedan od najvoljenijih svetskih govornika, definitivno sada znate. Ceo ovaj njegov govor je snimljen i nalazi se live na webizovoj Facebook stranici, tako da podelite ga na društvenim mrežama ukoliko mislite da bi još neko trebalo da ga pogleda. Sutra će također biti Q&A sa njim, tako da sačuvajte pitanja. Za deset minuta se vidimo ponovo, ovdje bit će svečano, svečano otvaranje.